good afternoon. Thank you. Um, it's both a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Um, it's good to see colleagues who I've worked with over a number of years. Uh, and it's also uh, good to see new people and new faces, especially those dealing in the, uh, the field of combating human trafficking. Uh, I think it's important for all of us um, to take forward and consider trafficking and make sure, uh, especially in these times of uh, where credit, the credit crunch, where um, other priorities seem to be more important, that we actually keep the focus on trafficking and combating trafficking and continue to put victims, victim protection and victim human rights first. Um, today I, I want to deal with some of the policy aspects. Um, I, I've gone for a policy aspect because sometimes the policy environment in which we work uh, affects all those things we routinely do on the ground. Uh, it affects how we deal with victims, it affects the policies, it uh, affects uh, the legislation uh, and how we can help victims in the long run. And what I'm looking at is, is some of those issues around the European Union and its aspirations, um, its plans for a sort of a global trafficking strategy. And, and I kind of find there's the, the potential for a paradox there that as it strives to move forward and build partnerships and broaden its base, is the EU sort of in danger of alienating member states, you know, by bringing in or saying we should have types of legislation or types of victim care programs, is it in danger of alienating those member states, such as the UK and Ireland, who have got a national referral mechanism, who have legislation, who have ratified the Council of Europe Convention, as in Ireland have got an exceptionally good training manual, uh, does have multi-agency working across the board is taking a victim perspective. So in striving to bring everybody together and move forward into a global dimension, are we in danger, and this is the paradox, that we will leave key member states behind who ultimately will become isolated, work in their own silos, and ultimately could defeat the object. So the member states could end up working internationally, but not with all their members. Uh, and that's some thoughts around that. So. Um, there is an EU global strategy. It, it started, the Futures Group is right across the EU, uh, and it concluded that external relations should be a, prior to, a priority for the future design of the European Home Affairs. Um, and that was set out in a report in 2008. Uh, during the last uh, presidency, or the last trafficking day it was, the Brussels conference in uh, October the 19th and 20th, it was entitled Towards Global EU Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings. Now whilst the report from that ministerial conference wasn't actually taken forward, its aspiration was this global dimension. In November, and I will talk about it of last year, there's an action oriented paper and that's entitled Strengthening the EU External Dimension on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings Towards Global EU Action Against Trafficking. And whilst they may be sort of uh, headlines, conferences and action oriented papers, there's actually a networking uh, meetings carrying on. Um, there was one in Madrid in March towards global EU action against trafficking. So it is a reality that, that, that there is a, a global strategy. So, if it's got a global strategy, why we need to maintain EU partnership approach, and I'm in favour, we need a global and we need a partnership approach. We need a holistic, multi-agency approach to trafficking. Uh, without that, um, I believe that if you give one agency all the money in the world, it still will not look at all aspects of trafficking. Um, so, therefore, we need this partnership approach. Um, however, um, you know, I just have some concerns that the strategies may not take us away or may take us away from this partnership approach. Also, the EU strategy that's moving forward, is it change without evaluation? Um, and who else making the you know, EU strategy? Who are the policy makers within the EU? Again, 
uh, and other comments that uh, are for discussion. An expanding mandatory approach is sort of a one-size-fits-all. Uh, I, I know that um, you've just signed in Ireland the uh, Council of Europe Convention, a mandatory convention. There was no opt-out in any of the clauses. The more strategy, the more power Lisbon gives the EU, if every convention or is becomes a mandatory, do we there risk? Do we therefore risk countries opting out? Um, trafficking and immigration, interrelated policies, and I sometimes wonder whether the difference is understood. You know, there is a link, but is trafficking and immigration one and the same thing? I did a talk for the uh, Law Society of England and Wales, and somebody had written uh, a paper for all solicitors in England and Wales, and the first thing they called it, so they referred to trafficking as illegal immigration. And when you go through some of the EU strategy papers and policies, illegal immigration is there. Well, trafficking isn't illegal immigration. You don't have to be an illegal immigrant to be trafficked. You can be trafficked within the EU, you can be trafficked in country. And I sometimes wonder whether we're not differentiating between the two clearly enough. Uh, and finally, uh, I beg the question, is a glo global EU strategy realistic? Now, as I said, I'm in favour of a global EU strategy, but is the time right? Is it realistic for the EU by 2011 to hope to have such a strategy in place? Or do we need to go back and look at country to country and have a more concrete, realistic approach, which talks about key deliverables and what people are actually doing and should be doing, as opposed to some sort of aspirational approach? Partnership approach. As I said, we need that. We need a holistic, integrated approach. Multidisciplinary coordination and cooperation, Legal, operational assistance, especially across Europe and wider. Um, and there is talk about uh, mutual legal assistance being expanded and European evidential warrants, uh, better victim assistance and care and protection in this partnership approach. Um, and we live in a world of global crime and global criminals, different organised criminal networks, some of them serious organised crime networks, some individual networks. The one thing they have in common traffickers is they don't respect boundaries. I know in Ireland um, that one of the key players in the, uh, an Ireland was involved in the child trafficking network where they were flying from West Africa into, uh, into the Netherlands and one of the reasons they went there is KLM were the cheapest carrier. So therefore if Air France became the cheapest carrier or another European that the criminals, the traffickers would just move to a different country invariably they're not from the country where they're trafficking so we need this global approach we need the partnership approach uh, so the partner we need a policy to maintain an integrated eu because of that but again you know i, I beg the question who are the policy makers so what is the eu strategy where does it start from where are we going we've got the eu action plan lisbon stockholm program action plan implementing stockholm um, I'll just go through these briefly to just, you know, where we stand in re respect of, of the current EU policy and strategy. The EU Action Plan um, came into force December 2005. I, I think it was as a result of the, the UK presidency um, and asked all member states to have ultimately their own action plan. And, and uh, I know both the UK and Ireland have their action plans, as do some other member states. Um, and it had a list of goals, effective EU action, knowledge and scale and nature, address root causes, uh, prevent, raise awareness, um, improve our operational coordination in member states. Basically, it was about concrete and key deliverables within member states and coordinating them, coordinating them across member states. Lisbon. And I'm not going to talk about Lisbon in this room. I know that it, uh, there's far too many experts for me to even begin. Um, but what it does gives a comprehensive common policy, a legal basis uh, for a common immigration policy. But it allows for increased legal coordination, cooperation on criminal matters with member states. In fact, it gives the EU power, um, which I'll come to in a minute, that can be used to actually take forward its global response. 
and clearly it's, it's confirmed the role of the Commission and enhanced role for the Court of Justice. Then we had the Stockholm Programme, the annual programme for 2010 to 2014 within the EU. Strategic guidelines, and uh, it made trafficking a key priority. Uh, and it does actually, so I think it's the only part that does actually differentiate between trafficking and immigration. But it talks about cooperation with third parties. It talks about new trafficking legislation. It goes on Europol and Eurojust as coordination and information and analysis uh, bodies. Um, it then talks about the powers of the Commission, not only victim protection and compensa compensation, but again, the words within it, cooperation and prevention with countries of origin. In themselves, again, whilst aspirational and laudable, um, I, I do wonder, you know, within the Stockholm programme, should it have reflected more of the EU action plan and be more concrete in some of its key deliverables. The action plan implementing Stockholm um, from April of this year, um, it aims to ensure all, including third country nationals, benefit from EU progress. More effective prosecution convictions. The role of the anti-trafficking coordinator, which I think applications closed last week, uh, from memory. Um, it talks about directive on combating trafficking. Um, and then a number of reports on the implementation of the EU action plan. Also, the action oriented paper, which I'll come to in two, uh, 2009, it reports on the implementation of that paper. Again, as well as giving guidelines uh, on identification of victims, it again endorses this multidisciplinary approach <coughs> to trafficking. The action oriented paper is entitled Strengthening the EU External Dimension, and it's from November of last year. The aim of it is, is to develop a proactive, coordinated and coherent approach to combating trafficking within third countries. The strategy uh, will reflect the Union's objective for developing its external relations. Yet the EU is establishing itself in a global arena. Uh, again, it talks about partnership building, and the evaluation of this will be, and uh, I'm led to believe, not only under the Hungarian presidency, I hope I've got that right, in June 2011, um, but it's talking about having its global strategy finished, uh, the evaluation and, and a global strategy uh, in action next year. Then we have the Europe, European Parliament resolution on trafficking. Uh, I don't know if anybody's seen that, but it is it's quite a comprehensive, detailed document uh, with a number of some, some excellent uh, ways of taking it uh, forward. Um, and there again, there's due attention to the external dimension of trafficking and the dimensions of immigration, asylum, and reintegration policies. Cooperation and partnership between the EU, Council of Europe, the UN, and third countries and in particular countries of origin. Uh, and amongst those, it, it names the, the United States as a key partner. Uh, as, uh, then it goes, experience shows legal framework uh, neither sufficiently effective or implemented adequately. It's an interesting document uh, uh, in that it makes a number of key recommendations. Uh, and what I would say is it probably makes uh, a number of key assumptions that I'm not so sure are correct. It, 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 and I'll come to them. It assumes certain. Uh, one example is it assumes that countries haven't got effective legislation. But I've not seen some of the evaluation to actually to make some of those assumptions. Uh, and when it shows the legal framework neither sufficiently effective or implemented it adequately, I've yet to see the evidence of that. It's well and good saying it in a document to say, well, we need to do the following because people and member states have not put legislation in. They have not done it adequately or implemented it. But again, you know, has there been any evaluation to say they've done that or haven't done that, as the case may be? There's the proposed framework directive. The original framework directive of 2002, I think it would be fair to say it's probably its main objective was to ensure a degree of harmonization, especially harmonization of legislation across the, the EU. The new framework directive, um, it is, 
I think it's caught between the council and the commission at the moment. There are certain parts that, the, that one likes and the other don't and whether we're going to be altered. Um, my understanding is that will go out for consultation and discussion. And if everything is well, the new framework directive should be finalised. I think it's back before the Parliament or, or the Council in September. And if it's all well and there is, no, there is agreement, it should be in force in December of this year. That, that does, my Marion's nodding there, so I've got that timetable kind of right. Um, and it's not about support development for non-EU countries. It gives a broader concept of trafficking. Again, it talks about an integrated, holistic approach, victims' rights and criminal proceedings, effective prosecutions, investigations, prevention policies, and making public uh, transposition measures. Again, all laudable objectives. But again, is this in danger of making some of the assumptions that the European Parliament resolution makes, that these things aren't happening? Does it know they're not happening? Um, and whilst, again, these are things we wish to achieve, by doing that, should we initially, you know, are we doing it at the right pace? Should it be something for 2015? And in the interim, we should be looking at what is, for example, happening in Ireland. You know, is the concrete progress, is the good practice that can be taken to other countries, uh, other member states? And then we look at some of the, I've used EU actors because I, I did actually think long and hard for another kind of word instead of actors. And I'm not really quite sure. There's the Commission, which clearly. Uh, DG Justice, there's an anti-trafficking commission or coordinator uh, reporting directly to a uh, director general. There's Greta, the group of experts on the Council of Europe. There's a EU group of experts. There's an informal network of national rapporteurs which came in force, I think, in April of 2009. Uh, and somebody in the room might actually be on that group. Um, and they all have different roles. The commission, uh, a global approach to migration consistent control of our borders, the development of the EU's capacity to act as a significant partner in international cooperation in the fields of freedom, justice and security. It is now the DG Justice, um, and, and there's now a DG Home Affairs. Um, well, that's straightforward. And the Commission, well, I think we all know the role of the Commission, whether the role of the Commission and the role of Council are clear and who, who, who ultimately um, feeds into the best policy, I'm not sure. Then we've got the anti-trafficking oh, right anti coordinator. Um, that types of the job description. Uh, there isn't a role. There's a lot in there, and it tells you. But it basically, it is to provide the overall strategic policy orientation in the field of trafficking, including with a view to improving coordination, coherence between EU institutions, agencies, as well as with member states. Um, and also the role in there. Um, in particular in relation to third countries and assure all appropriate means uh, for EU action against trafficking are adequately used and mobilised. Again, it's, it's, it's taking forward this holistic approach to trafficking with all agencies. Um, the last I heard is, is whilst the position is closed, they're hoping to appoint and have somebody in situ again by December. Greta, uh, interesting. Um, Greta is the monitoring for the Council of Europe Convention. They are independent experts with a human rights background. Uh, they report to what's called a committee of parties, and the committee of parties can then make recommendations based on what Greta said. The interesting part about Greta is you can only apply or become a member of Greta if the, your member state has, has ratified the Council of Europe Convention. Uh, which makes it interesting when you look at some of the membership. Uh, you have a monitoring party or a monitoring body made up of members who themselves may have little or no, or well, trafficking policies. They may not have legislation in place. But the fact that because the way their uh, domestic situation works, that they, they can ratify straight away. Where uh, they're the UK and... Some, I think Ireland's the same, isn't it, where you, you can sign the convention, but you can only ratify once it's in your domestic legislation. So something like the UK could never be on Greta because the Council of Europe um, convention was the quickest convention ever ratified uh, in 18 months. 
which, you know, in the UK time is, is very quick. So therefore, but considering some countries sign and ratify on the same day uh, without putting it. So it's an interesting concept that you've got a, a monitoring group of independent experts who may not uh, have actually put any their own member states may not be compliant. Then we've got the EU group of experts, uh, 21 expert members. Um, we've got you know, part of the remit, enhance fight against trafficking, produce opinions, reports and recommendations, advise the Commission. Um, being tasked June of this year to develop the opinion of the group of experts into a global EU strategy. So that's clearly on the agenda for the EU group of experts. Then we have the informal network of national rapporteurs. Um, sharing best practice, create strategies, take account of member states' opinions, feed in ideas. Um, the reason I put those up is, 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 and I do ask the question, who, who is advising, who is making the policy? There seems to be a number of different groups with key terms of reference, but no cohesion amongst the groups, no communication amongst the groups, and each seems to be advising on a different part of policy. But throughout that, there does seem to be a singular lack of evaluation throughout the action-orientated paper, throughout the European Parliament resolution. It talks about legislation. It makes comment that legislation is not uh, brought in, it's not adequately uh, used. I've not seen a review. I, I'm not aware of a review unless member states have reviewed their own legislation. The national referral mechanism, it's comment through the, the, the rapporteurs, but there is this call within it for an independent uh, rapporteur, not, if not a rapporteur, an independent mechanism. And I ask the question in this room, is the Irish model independent? You know, would it mean that th for all the good work that's gone on here, that they, the mechanism would fall foul of European legislation? That you may say, well, sorry, any framework directive that said we must have an independent rapporteur, we couldn't sign up to. It's interesting to note that the UK and um, Ireland have already uh, done their parliamentary reservation on the framework directive. Um, Demwork, I think, has got a mandatory opt-out anyway, but they're, they're already in a position where they may not sign the framework directive. Uh, and this is at the start of when you've got two key member states not signing a framework directive on trafficking, that you're starting to move into their own silos, they're moving away from this necessary partnership approach. JIT. A JIT is a joint investigation team, and whenever you read anything now, uh, it says prosecution, investigation, good practice, a joint investigation team. There is one successful, or I, I say successful, I don't know. Um, I've been a party to it. I was at the initial meetings. Uh, I know quite a lot about it, and that's between the Romania and the Metropolitan uh, Police uh, regarding the Roma um, and investigating Roma children begging. Now, when the original JIT was written, um, I wrote an evaluation paragraph for a, 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 a independent evaluation. To my knowledge, there has been no evaluation of joint investigation teams. And the reason I, I say that is I'm not saying it's a bad thing, a joint investigation team, but how do we know it is good practice? How do we know it works? Because nobody's ever evaluated it. Um, you know, all we've been told is by those involved in it that this is a good thing. Uh, and that is, holds true for some of the other, the other aspects. We have EU member state action plans. Some have been evaluated. Um, if you actually look at the action orientated paper, there is, uh, from memory, it sets out what it aims to do. And then there are country page comments after it uh, you know, on each different country. I read the UK page, and it's what is written everywhere. It is the standard block blurb for the UK. We have done the following. But, you know, so is it self-evaluation? Does it mean because we've said it's being done, it's being done? Um, you know, victim protection. Is there been any evaluation of victim, victim protection in each country? Do we know what's good practice, what's bad practice, what's working? Then we have Eurojust and Europol and how the role of Eurojust must be central to the coordination and all cases, and we must have more cases um, coordinated through Eurojust how Europol must take a more positive role in intelligence gathering and, and analysing. Well, Europol has just got a new director uh, and has got a new remit uh, and is working in a different way. But do we know it's working? Uh, and what we have throughout these policies is a number of key 
planks of each of those policy where people are saying this is, uh, has been promulgated as good practice. And I wonder whether, who says it's good practice? Do any of those groups, though, working groups that I mentioned before, are they saying it's good practice? You know, and if so, what is right? What, where are we up to? Do we need some form of independent uh, evaluation, some sort of independent assessment on each country? You know, where is the EU up to? And I said a lot of it seems to be self-evaluation. You know, fill in the questionnaire and send it back, and nobody questions what's on it. Um, and, and the more we sort of get into the world of where we are in a credit crunch world, the more self-evaluation will probably go forward because people haven't got the time. I know there's been some Schengen evaluation around France and Belgium um, about what they're doing, but I've yet to see the report on that. And maybe we need more of this independent people going into a country to actually say what is going on. And again, the mandatory approach, uh, one size fits all. And these are some things, again, as I was saying, if we have mandatory framework directives, if we have mandatory conventions, victim compensation, now, victim compensation, um, it must be mandatory, all victims must get compensation. Uh, I'll give an example that one of the reasons victims for sexual exploitation do not get compensation all the time in the UK is because a group of eminent judges and those involved with victims around rape and sexual offences, not necessarily trafficking, but, it, but again, it's the same type of victim, actually have given an opinion that they think to actually give money from the person who had raped them is counterproductive. Now, I'm not saying that's right or that's wrong, but I'm saying that is a factor where somebody has said that when it comes to sentencing, you should think long and hard about giving compensation to victims of sexual offences because of that factor. And those involved included NGOs and specialists within the rape field. Well, if you've got a victim of trafficking who's been multiply raped, it, does that argument hold good? I'm not saying it does, but before we suddenly say compensation should be mandatory, do we need to look at the factors as whether it should? Do we need to have the debate? Free legal representation, another kind of emotive issue. Yes, we agree, but should everybody, every victim, I mean, and are we therefore putting victims of trafficking in a different category? Should everybody who's a victim of sexual offences have free legal representation? And the reason I put that on it is, is I'm not saying they shouldn't, but again, there is a debate there, and they are, these are things that can start to, countries will not sign up to. They will say, well, we're not going to do that, and therefore they don't sign to the convention because it's mandatory, they don't sign to a directive, and again, that starts to move them out of a partnership. So why the EU is trying to be aspirationally wider and global, by doing certain things, it, it can be counterproductive. Uh, a request for guardian for all child victims. Well, why all child victims are trafficking? Why not all child victims? You know, um, extraterritorial jurisdiction. Uh, you know, some countries don't recognise that. Unconditional assistance for all victims. I'm not saying these are right or wrong, and I'm not saying I'm not in favour of them. I'm just saying this is by doing this and not giving people the option to, to opt in and opt out can actually give us this, this position um, where countries will not move forward. Penalties and sanctions. Uh, some countries have excellent penalties and sanctions, but by being prescriptive, is it helpful? Legislation. Again, an independent rapporteur. And then trafficking and immigration. I touch on this briefly. You could probably have a whole talk on the difference between trafficking and immigration and do people understand it. Um, I notice a great tenant uh, of going forward is, is, is the problem around unac unaccompanied um, children. You know, is that an immigration issue? Is it a trafficking issue? It always seems to be part of the trafficking debate. Uh, but if you read some of the, the, the research on it, especially from Chinese uh, children and that, those who, who've done the academic research will probably say they're smuggled. I'm not saying they're not victims, but may not be traffic victims. Um, but is trafficking a crime? You know, do we need to recognise that trafficking itself is a crime and there are trafficking victims? And is that part of the immigration? And I put a legal because there is immigration and there's a legal immigration um, debate. You know, are we, is it to the detriment of trafficking that it's part of immigration debate? Should it be in its own and recognised as a crime, recognised as victims needing victim protection? Um, only Stockholm seems to recognise it's separate from illegal immigration. So it comes back um, to some of the questions that I raised at the outset. Um, 
is a global strategy realistic? Or maybe I should have said, is a global EU strategy realistic by 2011? Lisbon will allow us to take forward stronger action. It will give the EU stronger action to, towards trafficking. It now has that. But will that be divisive? Uh, as I've said throughout, if the EU, through whatever policy body, um, goes through and makes action, and all that action is in some sort of mandatory form, and because it can do that now, will it mean that certain countries um, decide not to join in? Maybe because they're unable, maybe because they're unwilling, uh, maybe because they're the factors that just don't sit with their own policies, their own domestic policies. Is there a need for an independent evaluation, assessment of position in each member state in some sort of timetable? You know, do we know, have they done a sufficient evaluation to know where each member state is up to? The original EU action plans were concrete, deliverable plans, the aim of, 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 of sort of delivering actions. Now, while some of it is not ideal, um, maybe we should go back and actually look where is each country, has each country got an action plan? Has each country got legislation? Has each country implemented legislation? Uh, has each country got, member state got victim um, protection? And maybe rather than moving forward um, with a framework directive or uh, a resolution uh, towards a global, we, we should maybe look at some sort of planning around how can we bring each member state up to a level where they can move forward. Um, you know, because it may well be, yes, we will sign up to a global strategy when we haven't even implemented a domestic strategy. The call for holistic action plans, more victim focused. Um, are they correct in principle? And this goes back, um, or are they built on sand? And I think that's the point, is if the EU moves forward with a global strategy, and 10, for example, of the 27 member states have not got anything in place. Are we building a strategy with no foundations? Do we need to go back and revisit those building blocks and make sure there are 27 building blocks there and then move forward? Um, you know, sometimes we, may, we can only move forward at the pace of the slowest, uh, and maybe we need to know what exactly the situation with the slowest is. And then, is the EU coherent? Who, make, who, is, who are making the strategies? Are there too many actors? Are there too many groups? I sit on the EU experts group and I saw the minutes last time of the National Rapporteurs group. And then you look at some of the other groups and then you say, well, is the duplication? Do they, each of them know what they're doing? Are they all asked to advise and write papers and on policies? Um, we spent some time writing a, a strategy about what was wrong with the EU action plan. And then there's the European Parliament resolution. Well, you thought that was probably a better paper than the paper the EU experts wrote because it was more comprehensive. Uh, and then you wonder, you know, is there a coherent or is that why they've gone for a, a trafficking coordinator to make it a coherent? And you sometimes wonder around the trafficking uh, and sometimes the immigration policies that there is no cohesiveness in the centre. Um, and maybe there are too many groups overlapping uh, and nobody's actually sat down and said, well, do we need this group or what does this group do or how can that have different ter terms of reference and work with some of the other actors? I agree an external dimension is necessary, but should it be a gradual measured approach? Can we get there within the time? Do we need to you know, take stock? And again, is there more need for a more concrete approach, identifying the key priority areas and applying concrete measures first? And those are the building blocks I was talking about. And then ultimately, we need to engender ownership. If we don't get each state or member state to take ownership and believe, we don't get each member state to make trafficking a priority, we'll never move forward. It will go down the scale. If Member states feel they are being dictated to by the EU, either by their strategies going forward, which they can't comply with or don't want to comply with, or by a whole raft of mandatory uh, resolutions, they may feel that they don't have ownership of it. 
And sometimes when you haven't got ownership of something, it doesn't become your priority to take forward. So I, I think in conclusion, uh, my answer is yes, a global player, but when is realistic? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.